Awesomeness. Hi guys, welcome to Fertility Talks. I'm Mary Wong and I'm the founder of Alive Holistic Health Clinic, author of Pathways to Pregnancy and your acupuncturist and fertility strategist. And today I'm super excited to have Dr. Liz with us because we're gonna talk more about nourishing for your fertility, which is so important. We've talked about it before and yesterday we were doing a webinar and we're talking about that as well. And so we cannot get enough of it. And I'm thinking that you'll likely give us some recipes because you wrote this beautiful book, which I must share with everyone right here. I have it hot in my little hands right now. Is it backwards to you? It, it looks straight on to me. Okay, yeah. perfect. For yeah. my, from my angle, it looks like it's backwards. So I'm yeah. so glad that you actually see it. Isn't that beautiful? I love it. This is all the nourishing foods. There's all the different colors. And uh, you wrote this and we'll talk a little bit about that, but really, we, you know, we're going to do the overarching thing. And before we do that, I'm going to share with everyone who you really are and, and just write, uh, read a little bit of your bio here. So Dr. Liz is the creator of the Well-Conceived Fertility Method, an evidence-based program helping women and couples to enhance their fertility, enrich their future child's health and empower their journey. In her book, IVF Meal Plan, she shows us how to nourish our fertility success through the power of food. So welcome. Thank you for being here and taking the time out. Thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to join you. <laughs> so uh, just so everyone knows, I'm doing this at home. There might be some outside noise. So just, you know, let's just disregard that because I, as I say, things are perfectly imperfect right now, and that's okay. <laughs> so let's just overlook that and we keep going. So first of all, um, how impactful is one's nutrition on fertility? Oh, that's such a good question, Mary. And um, it's a good place to start because food and nutrition ha are just so often overlooked, so often not mentioned at all to couples or individuals going through fertility care or having fertility challenges. And it's such an underappreciated and really easy to implement way to support your fertility success. Um, one of the studies that I reference in the book is talking about IVF specifically. We tend to have more data from IVF studies just because it's a, um, source of data. It's a source of randomized controlled trials and different types of studies because so much is invested in an IVF cycle. So we happen exactly. to have quite a bit of nutrition focused information from IVF and IVF clinics and patients. And in that study, it was found that couples who were both partners followed a Mediterranean diet had up to a 40% greater success rate so success with IVF being pregnancy and live birth. So take home, taking home a healthy baby. Then couples who ate a healthy diet, an otherwise healthy diet, which um, so that, that statistic isn't even compared to a not so healthy diet. So often couples are aware and they, they want to eat what they know to be a healthy diet leading up to preconception or leading up to IVF um, transfer, for example, but um, there's just less, no, less being told, I think, to, to patients going through that about how much power they have if they choose the right, like a, a healthy diet that's specific for fertility uh, to influence potentially both egg quality, sperm quality, and IVF or fertility outcome. Right. Yes. And, 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 you know, in Chinese medicine, we say that it, it is one of the pillars and it's part of your life and part of who you are. And so uh, we talk about how um, the transmission of the nourishment that goes into our body really requires some time though, right? It's not like, oh, just today I'm going to eat well. That's <laughs> right. A period of time. Yeah. That's right. It's that um, season of preconception that can have a literal transformation in the body and the physiology, but yes, it does take time. And the reason for that is quite simple. It's that every single one of our cells is a 
alive and in a state of either um, optimal health or not. And the more that it's stressed and the more that it contains toxins and the more that it has oxidative stress um, from various types of stressors in our environment, the faster that cell and its DNA is going to have damage show up in it. And this is true for eggs and this is true for sperm too. And so the reason why fertility outcomes can change with a season of nourishment, both body and mind levels, um, that can really influence cellular health in the DNA or genetic material inside our cells. And this is the power too of epigenetics and <clears throat> changing the very expression of the genes, starting with preconception with both parents, ideally, to invest in the their fertility success and also their future baby's health. And you've probably talked about this with all of your clients too around this preconception season and it is a Chinese medicine practice that's been known for millennia. And it's about, you know, it's an awareness that before a couple conceives, it's, um, and, you know, they take an intentional season where they're investing in their individual health too, because they know that it'll help them pass on the best to their child. You know, I love actually how you say it's the season because, and that's exactly what it is. Cause we typically say three to four months and very specific, but I just love the word season. So thank you for adding that in. I'll have to use that. I'll have to borrow it because <laughs> I live like 90, 120 days. That's, you know, three, four months. That's just Work on helping your body and your mind and your soul be as healthy and optimized as possible, which includes how we nourish ourselves both physically through food, but also, you know, nourishing ourselves through our lives, right? Yeah. So today yeah. we're speaking specific to food, yeah. but um, so, you know, we're going to keep going in that vein. And certainly we've had some conversations already on fertility talks about that. So for those of you who are watching the first time, you can certainly go down and scroll down and there's lots of other posts with regards to that and you know all things fertility really um and now we're going to keep it current because of course we're all in this face of adversity and yeah. for many uh we have uh, for those who are anticipating to be at the fertility clinic for the most part it has been shut down yes there's a slow move towards going back in and it depends on where you're at and what the circumstances are. I know some people are getting called back now or phasing in at least. Yeah. So, you know, in the meantime, if you're still in that waiting zone, what do you say to women and couples as we go through this season? Well, that's, that's very poignant because this is an opportune time for those individuals who have been forced to wait or defer or delay their cycles, who can't currently access their clinic or whose clinic isn't, um, hasn't put them in queue as yet, because that's just reopening like in the past week or so, mm -hmm. um, at least where, where we are, which is in Southern Ontario. <laughs> um, and we're hearing from, from clients globally that some of them are still absolutely shut depending on the region. Yeah, so this is a perfect, it's a perfect season to invest in your nutrition. Um, a lot of individuals and couples are finding that they have enough time to experiment with new recipes and to cook at home. And a lot of people are avoiding takeout anyway um, for the time being. So it's a very opportune time. And I just encourage everyone to allow themselves to see that silver lining because yes, we are in a very challenging time as families, as couples, as society. Um, and there are also opportunities and good things that can come through this. And why not use the time to invest in your nutrition, your rest, your self-care, um, and just start feeling really well so that when you are called back, you're going into that cycle feeling hopefully the best you've ever felt. Yes. Yeah. And, and that is so important. And so I guess the take home is, you know, certainly as a woman trying to conceive or as a couple, um, there is that urgency. It's like the perspective is, oh my goodness, every month is a wasted month. Yep. So 
the perspective can be, oh my goodness, I'm wasting valuable time. Mm -hmm. And the invitation, the opportunity is, let's not look at it as a wasted time. In fact, it's the opposite of that. We yeah. are using this time to create and nurture and nourish so that we can have the quality of the care, not just in quantity, because you know what, when you go back to an IVF clinic or, uh, and, and do IVF, IUI or whatever you're doing, we want you to optimize what you've got so that you're doing it in less number of trials, right? Like you want to yeah. have it a take-home baby. You don't yeah. want to just get pregnant. You want to get a baby. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't want the cycle just as soon as possible. You want it as soon as possible with the right preparation going in with the highest chances that that one next cycle is going to be the only one that you'll need. Yeah. Yeah. If so, at all possible. Exactly. And so it's like, wow, can, can we shift our mindset and go, okay, we don't like this, but wow, what a great opportunity and really shift gears, shift our thinking in a positive light, right? Rather than feeling like a victim of the circumstance, which can be very much a reality for a lot of people, especially when we're like totally self-isolating. Totally. And, and that's a great term for it because we don't consciously choose to feel victimized by our situation. But when we feel that sense that something bad is happening to us, that we have no control, we have a lot of uncertainty, and the bad thing keeps going on and on, and we don't see an end to it. Our physiology cannot help but go into the physiology of a victimhood, which is high cortisol, like high stress hormones, which skews our fertility hormone profile. It skews our ability to take in all of the nutrients that you're choosing so well to put into your, into your diet. Um, it steals our ability to get deeper rest from our sleep and it just skews our entire body and mind toward um, like survival mode instead of optimal mode. And fertility is a function of that optimal health and that optimal well being, And it will show up for you um, the more nourished that you are again, in body, mind, and spirit. Yes, thank you for that. So in, now in light of that, let's, I want to dig straight in. Like, I want to know, you know, in this book, what, what, are, what are some of your favorite recipes? <laughs> I'm going to start with the, uh, I'm going to start with the treats, Mary, because, <laughs> because, okay, well, I mean, I guess people, when they're first working with a with a practitioner, especially around diet or nutrition and fertility, they think that they're going to have to be restricted or feel deprived or that it's just going to be like a torture that they have to not eat their favorite food. So what we've done with the book is taken a lot of familiar favorite dishes, including desserts and transform them into um, not only great tasting, but also food that will further our fertility success. So I love, in fact, I just made more today, our strawberry mango compote. And um, compote, it, for those who haven't tried it before, it's like a, like a cooked fruit, almost like a sauce. So you can eat it straight up, warm or cold. You can put it on as a topping on two yogurt or coconut milk yogurt, or you can sprinkle granola or seeds on it or put whipped cream on it. Um, so there's all different kinds of ways. It tastes kind of like pie filling. Um, except not as super sweet, not as, not sugary. Um, and we use honey as an optional sweetener in that one. Um, so how many ingredients are in it? Pardon? How many ingredients are in it? Then? Oh, it's, uh, um, I'm going to say six off the top of my head, ma mango, strawberry, lemon juice, collagen or gelatin optional, but you can put a little bit of that extra nice absorbable protein into it. Does it taste like anything? Um, and optional honey. So that's five, if I'm counting. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the reason why I ask is that, you know, we're already bogged down so much. And I think some women, you know, they're trying, trying to do so much of everything. It's like, they want to do everything right. And sometimes I think simplicity is best, right? So yeah, you know, that recipe just came out of <clears throat> what I would typically have in the house. So we would usually have some frozen sliced, sliced strawberries, 
and uh, mango pieces in the freezer for our smoothies right regularly and usually have a lemon or two in the in the fridge or on the counter for lemon juice or lemon wedges so it's uh, and we always have honey so that um that recipe just came out of like what i was already <laughs> making and realizing this is such a delicious dessert it's totally satisfies your sweet craving it's full of fiber and um, it smells divine as you're cooking it um and like i said you can easily dissolve in a little bit of extra protein if you're if you want that um, so what's the extra protein that you would ask in this uh, add in? you can dissolve in collagen or gelatin got it yeah so that their difference being when you chill if you chill the compote if you've got gelatin in there it will firm up like a jelly yeah. like a jelly dessert um and if col collagen won't gel but it's it's got uh, absorbable protein either way okay i'm totally making this for sure i i i was trying to go in here and find the recipe but I'm oh gonna... they're at the back mary yeah they're oh. at the very back okay yeah, they're all in a section. There's a meal plan, there's shopping lists, and um, and all of the recipes are in in sections. Awesome. So we're in the treats sec section. I love it. I love it that there's treats in there because who doesn't yeah. like treats, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then another of my favorites would would be the chia chocolate pudding. So preconception, I definitely had chocolate cravings, especially with my cycles. And cocoa, raw cocoa powder especially, is a superfood. It's very friendly for fertility. It's rich in iron and magnesium and antioxidants. And it's, um, it's delicious. <laughs> and the chia chocolate pudding has omega-3s because of the chia seed. And mm -hmm. omega-3 is a really valuable type of oil um, to reduce inflammation in the body. And uh, most North Americans need more omega-3s to be added to their diet, like from seeds and fish and fish oil versus omega-6, which is uh, vegetable oils. So then here's a question for you, since we're on that realm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that in this day and age, um, we can get by with not supplementing and just doing food? Like, do we get all our nutrition and nourishment through food alone? Or do you think we need to supplement? That is a really great question. I can speak from um, some of the research and clinical experience and my own. When it comes to optimizing fertility, if you're in, a, in this sphere where you're already having known challenges, it is probably a good idea to look into what supplements your system needs more of. And that can come down to genetics. So some people need to supply more specific nutrients for their cells to pick up enough or they need to supplement them in a certain form that they can actually absorb and their bodies can make use of it. We know from um, the nurse's health study, which fueled the book, The Fertility Diet, mm -hmm. that um, diets or women that took in less iron, for example, had lower rates of fertility, higher rates of um, ovulatory infertility. So problems with ovulation or follicle or egg quality, leading them to not, leading them to struggle to have, have children. And um, most women, even if they eat animal protein, tend to be low in iron. This is something that I've seen across many, many people over 10 years of practice with blood work. Simple blood work assesses your ferritin level, which is your iron stores and your hemoglobin, and so many women are struggling to conceive in part because they're undernourished on key nutrients, iron being definitely one of them. It's also hard to maintain iron levels in pregnancy. So once you are pregnant, um, a prenatal multi with iron and it is highly recommended across most, if not like all general practitioners, and certainly in the research because the baby's growth is consuming a lot of our nutrients. And if you struggle with morning sickness and you can't take in your regular optimal food intake that you're used to either, and you go on like survival food, like, like I had to the past little while, um, that where you just can kind of tolerate like white crackers and you know, those foods are really low nutrients. So 
both preconception and early pregnancy or during pregnancy, it is often indicated in my experience that supplements are required. I think it's always a good idea to understand with your practitioner which specific nutrients you should supplement. So I don't think that everyone should just go and buy out all the things and you know just take them. You should be taking them for a reason that you're treating something or repleting a deficiency. Yeah. Um, vitamin D is another supplement that's important for fertility and even Canada's Food Guide, which is very conservative in terms of its recommendations, recommends that all Canadians be taking a vitamin D supplement in order to get enough because we cannot get enough from food and sun exposure combined, um, typically for most of the year. Mm -hmm. About 70%, I believe, right, of our population is... Um, it would be at least, I will say, from the population that I treat, which is a generally healthy population, um, 80 or 85 percent of the people that we refer for testing have a deficiency of vitamin D. And it is one that is often silent. There's not specific symptoms or a syndrome that's going to show up that's sort of apparent if you're low in vitamin D. Right. Yeah. Really needs to be tested. Yep. So and the whole point of all this is that unfortunately our our food chain is not enough and I would even add that you know our food quality has come down and our ability to get foods internationally doesn't help because you think oh great I have all this food right access but most of the time when you ship it it's not coming from the ground when it's ripe and it's you know truck ripened so it's not absorbing all the nutrients that it should really have that's right and that's why we tend to say eat more local eat more organic and you know what do you do right and but at the end of the day it's not like it used to be right yeah and i mean the cost of of being of having a few targeted supplements is so much less than continuing to struggle with with health issues or infertility and it's definitely lower cost than not giving your future baby their very best start in life. Because the just like our own cells and tissues, the child is literally built from nutrients that mother consumed in her diet. It's just, there's no other way of understanding it. It's just you eat something and that's going to be used by your baby to grow. Totally. Yeah. And thank you for putting that in. And, and then, so really what we want to consider as we're talking about it already, like just really drive it home where preconception is where it's at, because that's the beginning of like, you don't wait till, you know, people stop coffee, stop this or that when they get pregnant. And what we're saying is like, you know, we're going to impact this baby before it's even conceived. I know, it's so amazing, isn't it? It's so wonderful to think about that we have this opportunity. Yes. Yeah, and just like just like you were saying about the kind of clinic closures and during this time, anyone who's struggling with infertility is also given that bit of a gift in that there is time to think about, okay, how do I really want to build into this pregnancy and this life of the future child. So they have, you know, they have time, whereas some couples who, yes, maybe they get pregnant easily, they don't always have time or forethought because they're, they haven't been required to, um, but then they, they worry maybe that they, they haven't supplemented in advance or they, you know, they haven't cut out those, those habits that um, could have paved the way a little bit more for egg health or, or sperm quality even. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, is the time to do it. And, and yeah. so when, as you say this, then I also want, I'm very weary about, oh, then the guilt, right? It's like, oh, no. I'm not yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. It's not, it's not about guilt. It's just about seeing the challenges that we have in our own journey and the gifts that are within them. Right. And nice. everyone's journey is their own. And you can, it might feel artificial to turn a journey with or a struggle with fertility into some kind of gem or some kind of opportunity, but it's okay to do that. And it's okay to feel both um, difficult feelings and inspir inspiration around what this 
this particular moment in your life is giving you. So thank you for this. And I want to address something. So I want to thank Caitlin for um, participating in this because this is actually really important. So I'm going to read exactly what she says. Okay. I definitely find that I'm not eating as many healthy foods right now because I'm only shopping two times a month. So fresh foods aren't available or I've run out of them after a few days. So, and that, that can be a reality for a lot of people. So you're not alone, Caitlin. So the question then is, I have about five weeks until my third try at FET. So for those who do not know, that's a frozen embryo transfer with already pre-retrieved uh, eggs that became embryos. So they're kind of like sitting on ice waiting to and ready to be picked up. And so she wants to know what best suggestions for diet for the next month, considering that she's shopping twice a month. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you for that question, Caitlin. And yeah, you're not alone. I, I know we have struggled even in, um, we do the click and collect with our, our groceries right now. And sometimes they don't put in to the orders, the things that we order. And sometimes they pick out produce that is not that awesome. It doesn't last because it's super close to its downtime. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so this is a very real challenge. And for others, um, depending on where you are in the world and your circumstances, you might not be shopping more than twice a month anyway, even outside of uh, the pandemic situation. Um, so, in um, so so what what you can do is probably you're, if you're going for FET, you're probably taking a good quality prenatal multi. So that will give you some good coverage. Make sure that that multi does have active folate and an absorbable form of iron. Those are two really important preconception nutrients to make sure you're getting enough of. And the folate is naturally found in those fresh green leafy vegetables. And so if you're not having as much of those, you definitely want to make sure that you're having that preconception folate dose. And, um, and then work with you know, high, high antioxidant foods, even like canned kidney beans. Canned kidney beans are some of the highest antioxidant foods, even more so than, than fresh vegetables and fruits. To be honest, it's surprised me too, but that, I is, that is- I didn't know this. So I, I love these interviews because I get to learn something new every yeah. day. Yeah, so you can make a chili, you can use two tomatoes and then your dried herbs, um, provided they still smell fresh, um, right? They still smell good. They still smell like the herb, herbal smell. Um, your culinary herbs are concentrated uh, forms of antioxidants and certain minerals too. And so that, those will be good things to keep in your diet and they, they last you know, for months at a time uh, in, your, in your pantry. Um, so usually people can work in some of that. Um, and then try for superfoods that are available in frozen form. Yes, yeah. that's exactly where I was going to go as well. Yeah. 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 So you can get frozen chopped kale, you can get frozen blueberries, um, and then your seeds, um, nuts and seeds are also really valuable sources of minerals and healthy fats. And um, you can get like ground flax seed, put a few tablespoons in peanut butter, natural peanut butter without sugar in it lasts a long time. So there's a lot of pantry and frozen foods that are still very, very nourishing. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to remember too, that our, all of our ancestors would have dealt with times of famine and nutritional lows and seasons, right? And so we have the ability in our genetics to adapt to varying levels of nutrition. So that's why I recommend like, don't feel guilty, don't stress about it, do the best you can with what's available and have that multi in place to give, your, give you that peace of mind. Yes, and, and that's really well put. And it's about, you know, not reaching for perfection. You're just gonna optimize and do the best that you can do and that's it. Yeah, right? that's it and that will be enough because your, your body is super smart and it knows how to self heal. It knows how to do the best it can. It's okay, I have another question. Yeah. Okay, so 
<laughs> I love this. Martin Paris, who is a practitioner, he says, hey, should we be taking vitamin D during the summer time? It's a great question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And here's, so clinically, here's what I usually talk to talk uh, about with patients. I would like to test your vitamin D level. And if we're talking to each other in the winter time or the early spring, like now, we're probably all at our lowest uh, rate of natural vitamin D production, which is due to sun exposure on our skin. Cholesterol in our skin is turned into vitamin D. So the highest chances of you having enough vitamin D naturally through a combination of the minimal amount of foods that it's found in plus sun is in the height of the summer or like September. So I like to test and not guess. But if we're talking about a general recommendation, yes, according to Health Canada, Canada's food guide, yes, everyone in Canada who living, living in Canada should be supplementing um, throughout the year. It doesn't, it doesn't matter about summer. And also most people are sun smart and are using sunscreen um, throughout the summer months anyway, which blocks our ability to produce vitamin D. Exactly, exactly. And, and that is, you know, everyone, there's, there was such a scare about skin cancers for a very long time. So everyone's so super conscious. And then, you know, and we're going to add in women are, we like to be bang. We want to keep our, you know, skin. So we want to apply all this on. And then what happens is then you get more de vitamin D deficiency in the summer as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And as we, as we mentioned earlier, vitamin D defic deficiency is pretty much silent. You can't tell by your doctor talking with you, you can't tell by looking at yourself or the way that you feel that you might be low in it. And we just don't want to mess with that nutrient. It's a highly, it's a very low cost nutrient. Um, it's a relatively low cost test. It's not covered by OHIP, but it's, you know, around 40 to $60, depending on which lab you go to. And, um, you know, a bottle of, of vitamin D at a thousand units a day will last for months and everybody in the family should have it. And you don't want to walk around with vitamin D deficiency. It's a risk factor for infertility, but also for your bone density. And you don't want to arrive in your fifties and sixties with osteoporosis because you didn't supplement vitamin D. Yeah. It's just so exactly. not worth it. Yeah. So, and so when you say, oh, gee, I, I test. So are you testing multiple times in a year? We might test multiple times in a year, like twice if someone is very deficient and if they have you know if their vitamin d deficiency is impacting something else that they're working on like their fertility for example um, people with immune issues as well um, because vitamin d will modulate the immune system so it's important for both people that get lots of colds and flus and people that have autoimmune conditions which again is related to um, fertility challenges often so I might test someone who's really, really low, like if their levels are in the 60s or below on their test, start supplementing them at an appropriate dosage. And then at the end of summer or at the end of six months, let's say, we might retest just to make sure that that dose is effective. Right. There are four known sort of metabolic speeds at which we deal, our bodies can deal with vitamin D can make it and break it down. And um, that is genetically determined. So we, we can't know, unless we do the, the genetic testing, we also won't know necessarily just how much to supplement. Um, but I, I prefer to go by tests, don't guess when it comes to that nutrient. Right. And then, so on that vein, do you have a preference with regards to the liquid versus the pill? Form? Yeah, really, really I'm, not, I'm not aware of, I'm not aware of any uh, differences in, in uh, absorption or effectiveness. It's really just a personal preference. I like a liquid vitamin D is very easy to also give to kids in a liquid form. Yeah. So like a thousand units, which sounds like a lot, but it's like a microgram quantity. It's a very yeah. tiny amount. Fits in one drop, doesn't taste like anything. So you can put it on your kid's food or you can put it in your smoothie and you don't even know you're taking it. And, uh, and whereas some people get on pill swelling overload and they just don't like it. Whereas other people find it easier to kind of count things out 
and sort of set out their supplements for a week in like a pill counter kind of organizer. And yes. they like that format and they forget about it if it's a liquid because it's in a different place in the fridge or in the shelf. I was that person. I had the grandma, <laughs> I had the grandma pill boxes and it was like, okay, Monday to Sunday, right? <laughs> I always feel like people help feel like they're they they say they're a grandma or grandpa when they're doing it, which grandmas and grandpas are awesome, but why don't we have like really cool or funky or beautiful yes. pill organizers? Agreed. I like, I hundred percent agree. Okay. We'll make something. Okay. Let's design it. <laughs> <laughs> why should it not be beautiful too? You're doing something good for yourself. It should be pleasurable. Yeah, no, totally. And so then back to, you know, we are talking about preconception and then there is the, when we have early pregnancy and there are, you know, and it's a tumultuous time then too. So it's a struggle getting pregnant, but then there's this fear and struggle when you are pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. When you finally get that positive sign and then you're panicking and say, okay, I want to do everything perfect. But let's say you are that person that gets nauseous and mm -hmm. you don't want to take a pill. Then are you going to panic and go, oh my gosh, I can't take my pill. I'm going to vomit it up anyway. Do I worry? Hmm. Right. I got, I got to go there. I have to go there. <laughs> um, that's fine. I'll, I'll go anywhere with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I will share that I, because, well, I, I don't know if I, it was obvious before, but I, I'm currently in my second trimester of my pregnancy. And in my first trimester, I struggled with intense morning sickness. I tried everything, all the treatments. It would give me like little bouts of relief, but never, never complete. And I, I remember just starting to cry on the phone with my midwife because I felt so upset that I couldn't take my prenatals. <laughs> I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I couldn't even think about it. I couldn't bear to think about it, let alone smell them or, you know try to swallow them. And this is super common. It's super common that women have that aversion. Um, and also that certain prenatals make them feel sick yes. because of the smell or the, the B vitamins or the iron doesn't sit well in the supplement. So even though I actually custom formulated my own prenatal vitamins, I could not take it once I was pregnant. We're just, I'm just able to kind of take it now. So that's where I just felt grateful that I did supplement prior to conceiving. And I had good, I knew that I had good iron status. I'd never been anemic. And, um, and I just, she, and she, my midwife also reassured me. She's like, it's okay. You don't need that. No, the baby's getting everything they need right now. The baby's the size of a peanut. <laughs> Like, you're, you know, it's okay. And it's just as I would, and as you would have reassured your patients about the very same way, but when you're in it, you feel super sensitive and worried and anxious and you just want to do the right thing. And um, so it really helps to just connect with someone that can tell you you're, you're okay and it's going to be okay. And one day you'll be able to take those nutrients, but the, just trust that the baby's going to get everything that they need and just take food, like good, the best food you can, whatever you can keep down because it's better than zero calories and zero <laughs> calories. Um, it's better than getting into the hospital because you're just, you know, you're trying to, you know, you're feeling so restricted or you're so nauseated that you can't manage anything. Um, and yeah, and that's, I think, just giving ourselves grace as women and mothers, because this is a hard job. Um, it's a hard job before conception, and it's a, it's a hard job from now on in, as far as I'm told. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> <laughs> this is just the beginning, everyone. So, so just to recap that, okay, basically the gist of all of what you said about during pregnancy is that it really starts with the preconception. So nourish yourself preconception so that no matter what happens, when you actually finally get pregnant and if you are that, you know, pukey person, it's okay and uh, trust exactly what you said, the baby will get what it needs because here's the other truth. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, 
don't worry, the baby's fine. The baby's just going to suck you dry. Yes, yeah. Like the baby is good. <laughs> yes. yes, I'm a sponge. Yeah. And, and yeah. so just, just that's why it's so important right now to help yourself. And, you know, to Caitlin, like, and I, I'm so grateful that she addressed this. It's like, you know, yeah. and even with this challenging time that we have, we can still at least optimize in the best way we can. And still our body has the um, ability to nourish and create life and despite yeah. circumstance, right? Absolutely. People still had babies in in the starvation mode in, in yeah. right? Yeah, so. in nomadic times, in, in times when it was unheard of to access a citrus fruit in the winter season. You know, I like even, even our parents, our parents' generation would have a citrus in their Christmas stocking, like an orange. Right. That's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, they so, did it. They did it. <laughs> and, and they did it and we're here because they did it and you know <laughs> have to trust that there's an intelligence happening here there's a, there's a golden thread totally okay there's one more comment caitlin um thank you again my prenatal is chewable and doesn't include iron for my last pregnancy they said that was fine to add the chewable iron once i was pregnant should should you're saying wait you're saying i should be adding that chewable, it's like treat time when I take them. Oh. <laughs> wait, 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 I think I missed something. Should I, wait, I should be adding that chewable iron again before the embryo transfer. Yeah, I'll let you answer that, but I'm like, yeah. Okay, um, if, you, if you can, and you know that you don't already have a high level of iron, it doesn't hurt. Um, and it's just, if you, if you don't tolerate iron because it makes you feel unwell or you get constipated, then just experiment with the form of iron that you're taking because iron is a mineral that is highly oxidizing. And that means it just kind of binds everything and it can create oxidative stress actually. Yes. Our bodies know how to absorb very little of any dose that we're exposed to. So we're programmed to absorb little iron. And in the studies uh, around fertility, again, from the nurse's health um, study data, correlations with lower iron intake and higher risk of anovulatory infertility for females. So that doesn't mean that you as an individual must take iron in order to have a successful transfer. However, with any of, of my clients, I always make sure that they're tested for their iron status close-ish to the time of their, of their fertility care because your iron status is important both for fertility, but also, again, like we mentioned, early pregnancy and continuing into the pregnancy. So you can take a modest or small dose of an absorbable form of iron and feel good about that. And, or you can ask your practitioner to test your iron status and just make sure that you have enough because some people manage iron just just fine with diet and not, they don't need supplements. A lot of women do struggle with iron deficiency because of menstruation though. And because you're losing quite a bit of iron through losing, um, through that endometrial shedding every single month and needing to rebuild it. And a lot of what we see in a Chinese medicine view of fertility challenges might be what we call blood deficiency, which often correlates with low iron status. So I hope that helps the person who asked the question. That was Caitlin again. So yes, I think so. Uh, and yeah, iron doesn't usually come in a chewable form, but it can come in a liquid, um, yes. which is it can be easier to take. And don't, don't take it with calcium mm -hmm. and take it with vitamin C, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, I think we're, you know, we're going so nitty gritty and, and really I was all about the recipe. So I, I, just one last recipe in terms of what's your favorite mealtime recipe that you have created? Mm, I'm going to say the fish tacos. I love it's, fish tacos. I'll have to try it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me know what you think when you try it. Um, you can do them gluten-free or dairy-free if you want to. Um, fish is 
to me, when I eat fresh fish, I feel so good. Um, and fish dishes are a luxury in my household because my husband doesn't like or consume any fish ever. So <laughs> if I ever have a chance to access both fresh fish and the house to myself, that is what would feel like an indulgence for me. <laughs> Wow. So, yeah. No, I love fish. And certainly when we travel, I'll, I'll enjoy fish that's local. Um, but yeah, the, and fish is, um, fish is so beneficial for fertility. It's having more fish as opposed to red meat is a component of the Mediterranean diet. It's also correlated with higher omega-3 intake. Um, so, so many benefits. Great. So then here's the one last question, I swear, because we should wrap this up. So how many times a week for fish do you think is appropriate? Yeah, it depends on the fish uh, because yes, exactly. um, you've probably shared with your audiences, um, the, fi the fish situation is also concerning um, in, in certain levels because fish do tend to be contaminated with chemicals that are pollutants from an industry um, that are found in oceans and and effluents coming off, coming out of rivers into shrimp farms and things like that too, or salmon farms. And so um, I recommend a few resources in the book and one of them is seachoice.org. And um, there are also various lists maintained by your municipal or state or provincial jurisdiction that talk about the fish species that are local to your lakes or your sea, sea locations that tend to be more contaminated or more of concern. Mercury, PCBs, those are the kind of chemicals that can be found in fish. So general rules, smaller fish, like younger ones. So um, a lot of canned tuna tends to be smaller fish. Um, so the younger, the smaller they are, the younger they are, which means they've had less time to accumulate these toxins from the ocean. Um, and lower on the food chain. So the higher food chain species like shark or mahi-mahi and big fish that pre predate, prey on other smaller fish will accumulate a much higher per uh, proportion of toxins too. And then for those are, who are concerned, um, just use fish oil and use fish minimally or only when you travel and you know that species is locally line caught um, and is fresh and in season to that area. Um, most, most sort of national nutrition authorities will say fish species no more than three times a week for preconception and pregnancy. It may need to be less depending on what fish you're eating and individual your individual genetics, to be honest, because all of our um, detoxification abilities is in part, if not, well, I would, I would say primarily, um, do is primarily related to our genes and how how we produce the enzymes that transform chemicals into forms that can be excreted from the body instead of hang out and get stored in our fat tissue. Right. Yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a bit of a conversation. Um, well, it's different. Every, everybody's different, right? So it's basically yeah. what you're saying. And then, yeah. um, and then, so now, of course, I'm like, that was the last question, but now this is the last question. Yeah. <laughs> because not everybody's going to eat fish. Yeah. Or, you know, some people are vegetarian. And so does, do you cover vegetarians in here? We have certainly vegetarian choices and, and meals too in there. Um, and, but most of the entrees, like the lunches and the dinners will have either egg or some form of animal protein. And the reason for that is simply that, um, again, from the research, there's, um, there's very little evidence that a vegan diet is safe for pregnancy um, unless it's specifically supplemented. So vegans who aren't eating any animal sources at all typically need to supplement iron, vitamin B12, vitamin D, as does everyone, omega-3, and choline. 
And choline is an important nutrient for baby's brain development, um, as well as it's part of our bile, which it allows us to process fat soluble toxins. And there's, um, there's better evidence that a vegetarian diet with some animal protein, like either dairy and or eggs in it, could be a very nutritionally complete approach. Um, and in the nurses health study, um, those who had less red meat, but certainly con uh, consumed poultry and or fish and eggs tended to have uh, better fertility outcomes than those who ate more red meat um, and processed meat. So it's not to say that you can't be choiceful about the source of the animal protein. I always choose organic or free range or grass fed beef or um, free range chicken and eggs. And I find that the taste better, especially when I was first pregnant, I could taste and smell when, when we couldn't access our farm, our farm, uh, farmer's market foods for a few weeks there until mm -hmm. we started to go direct to the farm. I could tell the difference and I was not agreeing at all with, with that level of sensitivity. And um, some studies show that those types of animal foods raised that way do tend to be more nutritious too. Right. So yes, you can modify the diet. You can substitute foods like firm tofu um, or a higher proportion of lentils, beans, and nuts and seeds in place of some of the animal, animal food-based suggestions in the book. Um, but it would, be, um, it would be worth looking into if you want to follow a vegetarian diet and certainly a vegan diet with a practitioner who's well-versed in preconception and pregnancy to make sure that you're getting all the nutrients that you and your baby will need. Yes, that's so important. That is okay. Cause it's like, you know, we want to be our own doctor, especially when there's Dr. Google available, but really when it comes to this and creating life, not just for right now, I mean, it's, this is for life. We yeah. want to make sure that we're setting ourselves up properly. And so I, I do highly recommend, you know, let's see Dr. Liz, for example. Right. And, um, Maybe you could put your um, email, but you know, we can just look you up. What's your uh, clinic called again? The clinic uh, is to Rivers Health. We're based in Guelph and I work with patients across Ontario by telemedicine or they can come to the clinic and meet me if they want in person. Uh, but for fertility consultation, anything except acupuncture, right now. Uh, we, can, we can generally do sort of virtually or remotely haven't figured out the remote acupuncture, but maybe that's something you and I can invent too, Mary. Right. Well, yeah, so I Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so I, I, we are doing this a virtual oh, yeah. acupatching. Yes. But for those who have not heard about that, we are doing acupatching because it, it's like, how can we help you while you're sitting at home and you, you, you know, for those that have had acupuncture, it's like, oh my gosh, I miss my acupuncture. What do we do? So I had to search high and low. And one of my colleagues out of the States, she's a pediatric acupuncturist. And she told me, hey, Mary, we're doing acupatching with the kids. And I thought, my gosh, and she's been seeing spectacular results. So I thought, well, you know, obviously we're taking it one step further for preconception and, and also for really for the general population. And so it's basically what it is, is you're taking light therapy technology in a form of a patch and put directly on acupuncture points. So you do this in the comfort of your own home. And ideally it's a practitioner that will guide you as to where you put these points, but the patches themselves, what we know is our bodies naturally emit light and that light is electromagnetic waves. And this patch, as it's on the body, placed on the body, it will reflect back specific wavelengths of light back into the body so then it'll cause biochemical changes. It can, like for example, the glutathione patch, it's called glutathione because the specific wavelength of a light that gets reflected back stimulates the production of glutathione. And as you know, it's a master antioxidant in the body. And so it's a natural way of having your body produce it. And in fact, in the studies, they said that it, it produced something like 300% more within a 24 hour period than compared to naturally occurring in the body, which I think is fantastic, especially when you're trying to conceive because we wanna minimize oxidative stress in the body, right? Yes. 
anyway, that's that's one thing. Uh, there's you know different kinds of um, patching systems. The uh, the doctor he, he's actually a scientist and he's done this amazing thing. So like I just thought, okay, I, we have to try because what do we have to lose? So we've been utilizing it on some patients. So, you know, literally it's an experiential science growing in the field for fertility, because typically they're using it for pain and stuff like that, that people, there's tangible results on. This company is about 15 years old. But what I've seen is they have this one called X39, which is stem cell um, enhancer. So it helps to mobilize and activate stem cell production, which is also important if you're looking at creating life. Anyway, so that's another aside and a different conversation. So I can, I'd be happy to take it offline and we can talk about that. It's, I'm, I'm really thrilled with this. <laughs> Very exciting. Yeah. And so before we um, leave everyone, because, you know, we've been chatting for a while. So again, this book is called the IVF meal plan and you can get in touch with Dr. Um, Liz <clears throat> on your own. And, and of course, you have virtual consults. We have consult, virtual consults at Alive Holistic Health. So, you know, definitely, if you want to do acupatching, our staff is ready to help you with that as well. And um, just as an announcement, tomorrow at 1 p.m., so I want, like everyone, including you, Dr. Liz, I want you to set your alarm for one o'clock because my book is going to be on sale. My book, Pathways to Pregnancy, is going to be on sale for 99 cents, the ebook version. And um, my publisher had agreed because uh, I just actually completed my audio version for my book. And I had in my head, I'm like, oh, this is times of COVID. I want to put that on sale. And what I found out when I put it in, they said, no, Audible does not allow for discounts. So I'm like, darn. So I'm like, I still want to do something. So this is where I reached my out to my publisher and they said, yes, okay, we can do something. So they gave us tomorrow at 1 p.m. to 2 p.m., 99 cents. So you'll never get this deal again. And really it's like less than a cup of coffee, which we're not even buying anyway. So you're saving money, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, it's only for that one hour. So between one and two Eastern. Okay. So that's why I've set the alarm. Yep. And, who knows? It might go a little longer, but I just want you because I, I don't know how it works exactly. I've never obviously done this before. So yeah, just, just need to like search it in Amazon and queue up the uh, the e version. And then when it turns, when it strikes one, just click. Well, it's five, right. well, it's, yeah. five with one click. Yeah. <laughs> Bye now. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. And so if you have family members, you have your friends, you can like by double click. <laughs> you it. I don't actually know how that works with the ebook, but anyway, um, it'll be awesome. And I know now I've heard that people are buying less print books and they're doing more um, ebooks, which I thought was interesting. And then oh, now yeah. the audio book. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be able to provide that. And for those that you, of you that are listening, it's going to be in my voice. Well, it is in my voice. The, the narration, I did it. Someone said, and other people said, oh, you should have someone else do it for you. It'll be easier. And I thought, no, but then it won't be my book. Yeah, I love hearing authors narrate in their own, read in their own voice. That makes it so much, so much richer as an experience. Yeah, I, I'm so I, glad you did it that way. I agree. I agree. Anyway, so I'm not an expert in, you know, narration, but I came from the heart and I did it like a gazillion times. So, <laughs> but it is good. And I updated it a bit through my, the audio version for sure. Anyway, we could just keep on talking all night, but we're not going to do that. So everyone, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here, Dr. Liz and taking time out. And it is late now. We all need to get ready for bed. And so come back next Wednesday when we're actually going to be doing fertility talks during the day, um, which is not normal. But due to certain circumstances, we're just doing it during the day. And it's at 11 o'clock and we're going to do a live demo for food. So this will be awesome. Just to keep things a little lighter. And, you know, I know some people have been asking about food. So we're going to do that. So again, thank you again. Thank you all for watching. And again, like this page, share it, share the video, 
uh, go on to my YouTube channel, which is Meet Mary Wong, and all of the videos are already there waiting for you. So check that out all for free, of course. So subscribe and um, we'll see you soon. Take care, guys. <laughs> Thank you.